a really great pleasure, and truly, I mean that. People always say that, but I really mean that, um, of introducing a colleague and friend whom I have long admired, and you'll soon see why. Jocelyn Olcott Jolie is Professor of History, International Comparative Studies, and Gender Sexuality and Feminist Studies at Duke. I've had the pleasure of hearing her speak and read on multiple occasions, and I can only begin to describe the treat you're in for this morning. Jolie's work is motivated by her conviction that women's stories properly told can elucidate questions that have long plagued, plagued historians and others. Consist consistently praised for its meticulous argumentation and exhaustive research, her first book, Revolutionary Women in Post-Revolutionary Mexico, Duke Press, <clears throat> uses case studies from a range of regions, including urban and rural women's movements, to show how, as she puts it, people live citizenship. Women and politics are not, she contends, two solid objects colliding, but rather a complex interplay producing new possibilities and further troubling the categories of women and politics. This study of diverse women's political movements offers important insight into the gendering of citizenship, not only specifically in Cardenas, Mexico, but in the global south and beyond. With her second monograph, International Women's Year, the greatest consciousness raising event in history, Oxford Press, Jolie models how to do transnational women's history with a particular focus on the global south. Her impressive chronicling of the legacies of the 1975 UN World Conference on Women held in Mexico City shows how the chaotic tensions and debates of the event yielded global feminist movements, including women's NGOs and worldwide feminist political net networks. Jolie documents how the struggles among women from a range of backgrounds led to the development of feminist activist methodology, methodologies, but she also shows how Cold War tensions and political exigencies entwined with the multiple agendas at the conference to put the nature of feminism itself at the center of these controversies. Whether, for example, feminism should focus on the plight of women or on anti-colonialism. Through the legacy of these debates, International Women's Year chronicles the emergence of neoliberalism. In her current work in progress, The Revolutionaries, The Revolution's Revolutionary, I'm going to say this wrong, I don't speak Spanish, I'm sorry, I wish I did, Concha Michel and 20th century, no? <laughs> okay, and 20th century Mexican cultural politics, Jolie returns to the character who framed revolutionary women, a woman she describes as zealot-like in her uncanny appearance at some of the most important cultural and political event events in 20th century Mexico. Among the many things that compels her about Concha Michel, Jolie is intrigued by the story of Michel's first child, an illegitimate daughter whom Michel claims in a 1977 interview died in a casa cuna, or orphanage in effect, while Michel was forced to work away from her child. As she has researched this figure, however, Jolie has come to doubt the actual existence of the child, and that mystery is at the heart of the story she plans to tell. Is the child's death part of Michel's biography, or is it, as Jolie puts it, in the spirit of testimonio, the story of many Mexican wage earners? The question turns the biohistory of this Zelig figure into a meditation on feminist biography. Informing all of these works is a fascination with the gendering not only of citizenship, but of the everyday struggles of lived experience, an interest that has led Jolie to a really extraordinary project entitled The Value of Love, Global Perspectives on the Economy of Care, through which she proposes, and I'm quoting, to reconsider the question of the value of care labor from the perspective of the Global South. Having assembled an impressive international interdisciplinary working groups, many members of whom I believe are in this room, she proposes to investigate the relationship between the production of knowledge about the value of labor and the laws, politics, and practices concerning the value of care work. The working group, which will be meeting for the first time in early April, will consider these questions with an eye towards proposing policies and practices that better recognize and reward the value of care or love labor. I don't think I need to tell this audience that this project, 
has at its core an understanding of how labor is gendered and valued accordingly. This spectacularly original approach to an intractable problem much discussed in feminist literature is characteristic of the creativity and commitment of this phenomenal scholar, teacher, and colleague. And I would be remiss not to remark on Jolie's really indomitable spirit, which is evident in all of this work as it is in everything she does. Please join me in welcoming Jolie Alcott, who cares, rethinking the value. Okay, uh, so uh, I'm terrified, <laughs> that's okay. Um, I wanna thank Priscilla Wald, first of all, for giving me this opportunity to talk with you today. This has been a forum, the Feminist Theory Workshop, that has really quite profoundly shaped my own work and thinking about a lot of, um, really all of my scholarship over the years. I don't know where this goes. Um, so, I, and I will confess that had she given me more time to consider what I was getting into, that is to say more than like an hour, I would have um, maybe <laughs> thought the better of, of pinch hitting here. Um, but I, but the, I'm really eager to, to open this conversation to you. I'm trying to like calm my nerves, I'm sorry. Um, so when I was thinking about what I might talk about today, and the when in that sentence is like, Thursday, so on Thursday when I was thinking about talking about today, uh, I um, thought about two or three possibilities, um, two, one of which was to give a talk that um, I think a few of you actually already heard, which is based on my 1975 book about the International Women's Year Conference. And the idea, the kind of conceptual investments there with what I came to think of as dissensus feminism, so following Rancière and this idea of a kind of frictive politics that, that, is a, that generated a, a particularly enduring form of feminism. Uh, and then the other talk that I thought about giving um, was another one that I sort of had in the can, which is a talk based on this biography project. And again, is using that project to explore the conceptual questions about uh, feminist biography, new biography, and in particular, the decolonial turn. And the, way that the, the ways that the turn toward decoloniality have allowed us to reconsider the questions of social categories and, and dyadic thinking. I decided instead to go a different direction, which um, is rather than to thinking about the ways that the conceptual framing allows me to, to make sense of a research project, talking today about the ways that an archive that I've assembled over the past uh, almost three decades of thinking about these questions have led me to return to a series of theoretical and conceptual eng engagements, some of which I think are gonna be probably pretty familiar to most of you, but that, as, uh, as Priscilla was saying, really take us to, a, some, I think, some unfinished business from 1970s and 80s feminism, and one that I realized as I was going back through this archive of materials dating back to the 1920s has been a recurring question and set of problems around how we value care um, and, and how we might um, rethink those questions. So uh, this is a, if, I, I, I put those other two talks aside because I thought they were sort of too smooth around the edges and maybe didn't invite enough of a conversation. This may have the opposite problem in that it's a quite porous talk and uh, it is meant to invite conversations. Also because um, in early April we're having this first workshop, it's a kind of brainstorming workshop to try to, to begin rethinking these questions. So this is sort of a, um, maybe we can have an opening act to that and, and begin thinking about these questions already. But it just seemed to me like it would be a kind of squandered opportunity to come up here and give a talk that was already, I don't know, already kind of done, and there's a lot of smart people in the room. So I'm gonna give two disclaimers at the outset. One is that I am a historian rather than a, a theorist per se, and historians tend to have a somewhat ambivalent relationship to theory in much the way that Lauren Ballant was talking about yesterday, which is to say a combination of um, fascination and repulsion or something. Uh, and historians tend to be, um, sort of theory hussies, like we flirt and we kind of sleep with theory occasionally, <laughs> and then we'll like get bored or feel a little too constrained and we'll walk away. And so it's, um, 
it's, 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 I think someone was just saying to me that there haven't been many historians in the feminist theory workshop, and this may be why. Um, I, but we do tend to, so I think there's a, 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 a fascination with, with um, theory, but more as provocation rather than paradigm. And so that's where uh, this, will, this will be coming from. I think the other thing is that historians tend to be more interested in the ways that contexts and contingencies produce certain kind of theories or certain re-engagements with theories rather than theories telling us anything about history. So that's the sort of, I think, um, different approach here. Um, so, okay, my second disclaimer is just that this really is a series. This is not a series of answers. This talk is a series of questions. And I, I think that is kind of in the spirit of the feminist theory workshop. But um, if you're expecting to like dust off your hands and walk away on the question of care labor by the end of this, um, this probably won't, <laughs> won't do that for you. Okay, so the problem of how to ascribe value to various forms of care, and I mean by this not only household and dependent care, but also environmental and cultural care, and not only child rearing and toilet cleaning, but also sex and patience and activism. These questions have, of course, had their theorists at least since Engels. And since the 1970s, they've stimulated some brilliant and provocative thinking and writing, both from more empirically oriented scholars such as Arlie Hochschild, Patricia Hill Collins, Nancy Fulbray, and Evelyn Nakano Glenn as well as more theoretically minded scholars, such as Christine Delphi, Sylvia Federici, Chela Sandoval, and Nancy Fraser. So why return to this set of kind of familiar set of questions now? The most straightforward reason, to be honest, is that in a quite practical, quotidian way, and I probably don't need to tell all of you this, the problem is more pronounced than ever as a conspicuous market failure of neoliberalism leaving a detritus of precarious ad hoc solutions that are clearly unsatisfactory and unsustainable. And I, I don't know how many of you teach in this area. If you teach and you ask your students, so how are you planning to handle this problem? It is um, both inspiring and, and a little um, disconcerting that they, they also see this as a, as a kind of intractable problem. The current social and environmental crises have inspired a new set of theoretical interventions and perhaps create an opportunity for a fundamental reconceptualization of value. And I, I just want to underscore here that that, I understand that, that, that that's, I haven't defined what the value of, of this labor is. That's the, I think, core problem here is how we, what are the ways that we might reconceptualize value in a new paradigm? Uh, queer and trans scholarship and activism have radically reshaped ideas about gender and family formations, and a new generation of scholarship on race and white supremacy, along with the decolonial challenge to dyadic and categorical epistemologies, have undergirded the social structures of that, that have undergirded the social structures of care labor. The Me Too movement, along with the Catholic Church, have reminded us that the spaces that we have been told we should feel safest are often the most dangerous. So for many people, the family home is certainly no haven from the stresses of the outside world, not only because it is, as Maria Rosa de la Costa explained nearly a half century ago, the floor of the social factory, but also because it shields from scrutiny countless episodes of abuse and violence. Activist demonstrations around the world have connected feminism and, wide ranges, uh, and with a wide range of forms of care the new ecofeminism, uh, caring for cultural formations and social structures, a recognition that the sheer labor of non-whiteness and non-maleness demand forms of self-care that are often deferred until a breaking point. But the other reason that I've returned to these conversations about care, and in particular, care labor and the value of care, is because my archive reminds me that for all of the innovative thinking on this question, we've been stuck in a pattern of offering three unsatisfactory solutions to the problem of undervaluing care. Uh, those three being commodification, status solutions, and household redistribution. So let me just quickly explain what I mean by each of those. Um, commodification is, of course, uh, I think the most widespread now uh, because of the moment we're living in, but framing everything from cap and trade policies to curb carbon emissions 
to care laborers who often leave their own dependents in the care of others in order to migrate to care for others, to care for families elsewhere. The commodification of care labor obviously has a long history, but its current formations reflect the neoliberal conviction that the most efficient and effective distribution of resources will occur by establishing a market-defined price. In turn, status solutions include everything from public education and transportation to programs such as Brazil's Bolsa de Familia or Britain's National Health Service. These programs are generally as much about discipline as they are about welfare, and they usually rely either directly or indirectly on some form of commodification. That is to say, those can't be completely separated. The household redistribution schemes, and these vary quite widely, um, include not only having care labor shared more equitably among genders, but also distributing it among extended kin or fictive kin networks. So this last approach mitigates the individualizing and atomizing aspects of the first two, but it still leaves care notably undervalued in the sense that those performing care laborers often have a diminished opportunity to make claims on rights and resources. Today I'd like to consider three moments where I see these questions returning. My historian's impulse is to lay them out for you chronologically to showcase the context in which they occur and the unfolding of change over time. But because I'm struck by the resonances among these moments, I'd like to consider them thematically. Although I couldn't quite resist, I do lay them out chronologically first, I have to admit, I see. Anyway, yeah. Um, so the three moments that I'm considering are, and are post-revolutionary Mexico, you can see this comes from my own, right? Post-revolutionary Mexico, mostly the 1930s drawing from my research for the first book, uh, Revolutionary Women in Post-Revolutionary Mexico, as well as this biography project I'm working on right now. Uh, the second moment's the 1970s, drawing mostly from research for the second book on the UN Women's Conference. And then finally, I thought it would be interesting and helpful with all of you to think about the current moment of renewed challenges to patriarchy and to capitalism that we're seeing. And that, and that I frankly are find, am finding quite inspiring. Um, these moments happen to come from materials that I've been working with, but they also reflect moments of what Nancy Fraser refers to as boundary struggles, historical conjectures where there are struggles over the boundary between economy and society, between work and family, between production and reproduction. Obviously, a set of questions that Kathy Weeks um, has also taken up in her problem, in her book, The Problem with Work, her problem, the book with work. Uh, I would quibble somewhat with Fraser's periodization, and I'm not convinced that we're ever actually outside of boundary struggles. So the moments that she particularly defines, um, I, I'm not sure that they're actually that discreet. But I, I do think that you might find a similar archive of boundary struggles from different times and places. So to use that kind of Polanyi-esque model of, of um, that, that interface between society or, or society defending itself from economy, I think is actually um, a generative one. Okay, to give a quick introduction to the archive I'm drawing from. Uh, let's see here. Okay, moment one. No, okay, here we go. Um, so upon returning from a long stay in the Soviet Union in 1933, the singer and activist Concha Michel, who's the subject of this biography, published the pamphlet Marxistas y entre comillas Marxistas, opening with the assertion that, quote, nothing could be more damaging to the realizations of the aspirations of every sincere revolutionary and directly to the working class than the fact that the exploiters of each country have become the revolutionary leaders. That is to say that they falsify the leadership that the, le that the revolution needs to triumph. The Communist Party, she explained, had failed to develop a precise line on the, women's quest the woman question that would recognize women's double enslavement by class and sex. In particular, she argued that the Mexican and Soviet revolutions had fallen short because of their failures to attend to what she referred to as the natural economy. She's making this distinction between the natural and the social economy here, which um, I would be interested in going back to if people are interested. It, it ties in, I think, in interesting ways to both decoloniality and to um, a sort of new eco-feminism. So the natural economy, which is the economy of uncommodified, productive, cultural, and agricultural labors. The pamphlet, unsurprisingly, and not just because of this aspect, resulted in her expulsion from the Mexican Communist Party. 
uh, when she not only refused to renounce it, but then she published a book elaborating on her, on her ideas um, in, this, in Dos Antagonismos, Dos Antagonismos Fundamentales. These two books became the foundation of a lifetime of political thinking, writing, and activism that gained a following among those who saw her as offering a particularly Mexican brand of feminism. And one of the reasons that she's been intriguing to me is that uh, much like the question of care labor, over the years you see her, um, a new group of, of women activists. She, of course, was a communist. She disavowed the label feminist, but a new group of women activists and feminists would uh, invoke her again, I think, with, in a, with a reference to a lot of the ideas that, that she starts talking about here in the early 1930s. In a particularly prominent expulsion notice in the party newspaper, El Machete, the Central Committee explained that she was quote, not in agreement with the fundamental points upon which the communist movement rests, and that given the party's position on women's issues, she would no longer submit, that, and that she would no longer submit to its authority, she would be, um, you know, expelled from the party. Party officials chalked up her defiance and false consciousness, as they saw it, to her bourgeois antecedents and her anti-Marxist conceptions of working women's role in the revolutionary movement. She petitioned unsuccessfully to rejoin the Communist Party, but made it clear that she would continue her efforts with or without the party's support. And, oh wait, can I go back? Yeah, I can, here we go. Ah, I'm not driving this machine. Okay, here we go, sorry. Um, a few months after she was expelled from the party, she drew international press attention when she led a group of 250 rural women to occupy the Hacienda Santa Barbara, which was owned by the former president and longtime political boss, Plutarco Elias Calles. She submitted an elaborate set of demands to transform the property into the Revolutionary Women's Institute, a women's residential facility that would provide maternity and child care and create income earning opportunities that would allow women to attend to their children. One of the many paradoxical things about her is that she writes a lot about gender complementarity, but she's always, all of her activism is around gender separatism, which that's maybe another conversation. Uh, anyway, so this is moment one. Moment two. Moment two is the mid-1970s, which is this moment from the UN conference, which brought a whole set of, a whole host of demands around questions of care labor, um, many of which are probably familiar to most of you, in particular, the Wages for Housework campaign, to which I will return momentarily. Uh, it also, did I need to do that? Uh, it also brought one of the most ambitious legislative efforts to address the problem of care labor, the 1960, 1975 Cuban Family Code, which was released on March 8th of International Women's Year and mandated that men and women share the obligations of family care. I, this, of course, is a law honored only in the breach, but it is um, notable that this was for a regime for the Castro government was, and, and a, a Fidel Castro participated quite actively in the drafting of this legislation. Uh, the third moment, of course, is, is the present day, and it's brought us not only uh, Me Too, but also the women's strikes, um, which start in 2000, um, in part by one of the organizers of one of the original authors of the um, Wages for Housework campaign with a particular emphasis not only on increasing the visibility of care laborers, but also on connections with concerns about gender violence and environmental degradation. Both the popular and scholarly fascination with the richly problematic feature film Roma highlight a widespread interest in wrestling with this question of care at the intersection of race, class, and gender. Okay, so those that, that's the basic archive. There's a, a lot of other things you could toss in there, of course, but th that's what we're going to that's what I'm drawing on for, for today. Um, I want to turn now to the thematics of this, or a set of questions. Uh, this could be infinitely proliferating, but a set of questions that, as I've been thinking about these issues, have struck me as particularly um, pressing or generative to work with. First of all, I want to insist following Fraser, not just Fraser, but including following Fraser, that we interrogate the value of care labor keeping not only political economy, but also geopolitics within the frame. And that is to say, not to try to think of these as uh, certainly family level or even national level questions, but um, that are broadly within uh, the frame of geopolitics. In the 1930s, of course, these conversations took place amid what was, at the time, the most significant faltering of the capitalist system, uh, 
along with the rise of the competing forces of the Popular Front and fascist nationalism. Concha Michel, for example, understood herself to be living and acting in an exceptional historical moment, a post-revolutionary aperture that seemed to open up unprecedented opportunities to transform social roles. In her proposal for the Revolutionary Women's Institute, the one that would be ho ho um, housed on the expropriated Hacienda Santa Barbara, she demonstrated a keen awareness of the sped up, opportunity-specific, revolutionary temporality that she felt created an opportunity to redefine gender roles. She wrote to the president, Lázaro Cárdenas, the same theories that support movements for socioeconomic transformation offer no foundation concerning the liberatory principles of the female sex. The Marxist treatises commit the same error of considering the economy in a partial sense, that is, excluding what pertains to the natural economy, that is to say, her, um, what she sees as the kind of feminine economy, that consists precisely of women's efforts in the reproduction of the species. Therefore, it is indispensable to clarify the position that women assume occupying their place in the current historical moment of social rectifications. As the historian Mary Kay Vaughan has observed, the Mexican government, like so many others, in turn sought ways to modernize patriarchy and to bring it in sync with these contemporary expectations. In other words, to somehow create a narrative in which the revolution was also revolutionary for women. By the 1970s, the geopolitical context, of course, had shifted. Decolonization and the rise of the non-aligned movement brought a distinct political, economic, and geopolitical context. The non-aligned demand for a new international economic order intensified a neoliberal backlash that played out among other places in the halls of the United Nations. The, ge the global economic crisis of the 1970s sent many women from household labor to labor markets in order to make ends meet. And of course, the neoliberal interventions in places like Chile created a whole other set of crises that, that we can talk about um, maybe in the Q&A. Uh, feminist theories in the 1970s and the early 80s examined uh, questions of care and reproduction explicitly against the backdrop of debates about colonialism and its legacies. So I'm thinking here about Silvia Ferrarici's insistence in 1975 that sending women into factories was similar to sending factories into the third world, that it simply extended the reach of alienation and social degradation in ways that feminists should be fighting against. Similarly, Maria Mies famously connected housewifeization housewife with colonialism in her 1986 book, Patriarchy and Accumulation on a World Scale. And Selma James, the co-author of Power of Women and the Subversion of Community, that canonical text of, of the Wages for Housework movement, was as much engaged in anti-colonial and anti-racist politics of the Caribbean and, and of New York City, frankly, as she was with feminist politics. So the current moment is clearly shaped not only by a sense that we're approaching what may be an ecological apocalypse, but also the conspicuous failings of neoliberalism, particularly around questions linked to care. Um, there's an institutional effort in places such as the ILO and, a, and social movement efforts such as the degrowth movement and proposals um, like universal basic income but that basically are centered on mitigating the effects of predatory capitalism, and they don't actually tackle the questions of how we value care, this conceptual question. Uh, you'll probably recognize the, the capabilities model that, of course, is Nussbaum and Sen's model that, that um, makes its way into the, into the UN. OK, so political economy and geopolitics, first thematic. Second thematic, um, is, this is clearly related to the question of political economy, but it's the thematic of accounting. And it's um, one of the major objectives of a lot of the work around care, and certainly things like wages for housework, is the question of visibility, that the problem of care labor is a problem of its invisibility. In fact, one of the things that you see from that movie Roma is that we only notice care labor when it doesn't happen. So that really loud squishing of dog poop when the car runs over it that you know, kind of amplifies for you this, this labor that hasn't been done. Um, so to create visibility for labor um, has been a large part of the project from the beginning, partly because of the hostility of many economics departments toward feminism and feminist economics, and partly because the questions of feminist economics have resisted the modeling and econometric methodologies that prevail in economics departments, 
The UN and its agencies have actually been important spaces of knowledge production in this area. Uh, in many ways, this was launched uh, by Esther Bozrup in 1970 with her classic text, um, Women in Economic Development, uh, which was she did as part of her work for the UN and really launched what then became the Women in Development and then the Gender and Development movements. It's really centered around a reconceptualization of the concept of labor itself and the, a critique of the ways that various UN development schemes structured what counted as labor and the social organization of labor. In other words, that these schemes contributed to women's economic marginalization rather than the amelioration of that, particularly through its emphasis, their emphasis on mechanization and commodification. So by 1975, and this is a cartoon from the, um, the newspaper that was part of that 75 conference, by 1975, UN development schemes had become a source of humor, uh, the idea that these would, would actually remedy women's labor demands. The field of feminist economics grew out of these types of critiques, but from a particularly liberal impulse that the solution lay in finding a proper system of accounting. In other words, if you could simply account for all of that labor within a, a, a properly and properly rec politically recognized system, that would uh, resolve this issue. A central concern of all these re efforts was regarding care. Um, a central uh, issue dating back from Quentin Michel in the 1930s and, and through the 1970s wages for housework has been to render them visible in, um, because they have been systematically excluded from the various forms of accounting, in particular from GDP. And here we see Marilyn Waring's classic text of, trying, of looking at the way that GDP systematically excludes labor by women, and then the system of national accounts. And this is just a um, mostly drawing from Nancy Fulbright's uh, work, a review of some of the ways that women's labor or that gender shapes the way that women, labor gets accounted for. More recently, economists such as Lourdes Benaria have engaged in what they call an accounting project. They actually, it's capital A, capital P, the accounting project um, that is, again, housed within the UN and the ILO to address the fact that they see women working everywhere and constantly, but the vast majority of that labor appears nowhere in the economic data. And this is, I mean, as I'm sure you all know this, this of course has consequences because it has consequences not only if you're not showing up in the economic data, you're probably not going to get anything like social security. It also has consequences because a lot of development aid, particularly as it runs through the UN, which is, if you live in the United States, you don't really perceive the impact of the UN. If you live in most of the rest of the world besides Western Europe, the UN figures pretty largely in terms of its um, various agencies and, and funding uh, projects there. The, a lot of those funding projects, particularly through agencies like the World Health Organization, are um, the scale of them depends upon the scale of the system of national accounts. So this counting actually makes a difference. And there's an interesting research, I think, left to be done about why governments agree to these systems of national accounts when they so clearly exclude most of the labor that occurs there. Those, those changes that happened in 1966 and 1993 are because of that problem. But OK, so the accounting project attempts to categorize, label, and measure this labor to make care and love not only visible, but quantifiable. Because it, the quantifiability is what is required for policymaking within a neoliberal frame. Policies in a neoliberal age always require metrics and assessments. So part of what I'm interested in here is, is there a way out of that neoliberal frame? Is there a way out of that having to be the only way of thinking about these questions? It creates a challenge of categorizing care work, about what's in and out of care work, particularly as we kind of get into the weeds and we realize that almost everything falls in one way or another under this rubric, either directly or indirectly. Do we think of it as something that is process-based in the way that Eileen Boris and Rasel Parreñas have talked about the concept of intimate labor with more attention to what is being done? In other words, does it involve contact or intimacy or intimate knowledge? Or is it more of an attention to who benefits, to dependence, to self-care, to disabled, again, to the environment, or to culture? It's further complicated, this question of accounting, by the observation that Christine Delphi made back in the 1970s that most of this labor is performed, and 
now in more radically diversifying modes of commodification, often by the same people. So in other words, if we think about forms of labor such as food preparation or bathing or again environmental care, some people perform it uncommodified, some people can perform it in a semi-commodified way, some people perform it in a fully commodified way. And now I think with the advent of platform and gig economies, we see people performing it in this kind of hyper-commodified way. And so again, one of the questions, because we're all about questions today, um, one of the questions here is how are these, change, these shifting modes of com commodification changing the value? And again, can we sever the question of value from the question of commodification? Okay, third analytic, or theme, or whatever I was calling it, demands. So uh, one of the things that Kathy Weeks' analysis of Wages for Housework campaign allowed me to see was the importance of framing as a demand this question of how we recognize care, much in the way that Quanchi Michel and her allies framed their demand for Revolutionary Women's Institute. It's important to note that the, I, and I actually, learned this from Kathy's book, I didn't realize it before, that wages for housework was not actually the initial demand of Maria de la Costa's um, essay, that it actually became a demand only as it got traction. I think that gave me a, a sort of helpful way of thinking about this and how we might, um, that the, the role of activism in defining the intellectual, the relationship between activism and the intellectual project, which one of the things I want to get to uh, if there's time or we could talk about in the Q&A, um, is that the, with the turn toward the decolonial, which I think has brought more of activist thinking into the frame for, for how we analyze this. So that was, um, to me, a useful example of how the activism itself really framed the, the conceptual frame, um, developed the conceptual framework. I, the demands come from a critique of both commodification and socialization as solutions. The wages for housework, I think, was more about household redistribution, but also about recognition. And a critique of seeing uh, the home as a refuge and homework or sex as necessarily expressions of love. So there's a radical impact of demanding a wage for something that was seen as love. Uh, they pose a series of demands. I think there is an interesting conversation perhaps to be had about um, comparisons between the Wages for Housework campaign and campaigns for reparations, for example. Um, but it's seeing it as a series of demands rather than a series of petitions or reform, uh, for a, a petition or a request for reform. And then finally, and this again speaks back, I think, to Maria Mises' work, the efforts to transform the figure of the housewife. And this was also a project of Quanchi Michel, which is that she wanted to transform the figure of the housewife from the abnegating, serving, self-denying, feminized figure to a powerful, demanding position of the laborer who could demand the wage, demand through, sorry, make demands through the wage as a social contract. Uh, the other thing that I, th I think that um, Kathy Weeks' work points to and that I see in other moments of this and we certainly see now in the contemporary movements is the ways in which these function as a means rather than an end. And I, again, I think that's where we see the activism shaping the um, scholarship and, and vice versa. Um, okay. And then another example from this, and this is from Domotina Barres de Chungara, uh, was a figure who really uh, rose to prominence. She's a, the, um, she is the wife of a Bolivian tin miner, and she's best known for leading what was called the sort of, um, kind of innocently enough, called the Housewives Committee, which sounds like it would be, I don't know, like it actually, people did mistake it for this like bake sale committee, which it absolutely was not. It was like a hunger striking, um, incredibly militant um, ad, uh, auxiliary to the, to the tin miners union. But she wrote in this uh, 1980, so she, she sort of rose to prominence in 1975 in the International Women's Year Conference um, and, and became a, and, and remained a prominent activist un, until her death not, uh, just a few years ago. Um, but this is from a 1980 pamphlet that she wrote where she describes trying to convince her husband to allow her to participate in, activi in the activism of the Housewives Committee. Again, something you would think would not be too controversial, but he forbade her from doing so. And so her first move was to go on strike, um, which again, I, I was interested about and like how that is in conversation with the wages for housework um, conversations that were, that were by this point certainly circulating in Latin America. Um, she went on strike, which of course lasts for like a day because 
you know, like the diapers pile up and nobody's eating and the house is a mess and whatever. And her father-in-law convinced her to go off strike. And she then resorts to the accounting system, right? So she, the system that she then goes to is she um, performs all of this labor and she keeps close account of everything that she does. And then she puts a price on it. And she puts a price on it based on what she would have to pay uh, a caretaker and a food preparer and a laundress and all this other stuff. And she presents it to her, her husband at the end of the month. And of course, it's like you know five times his monthly salary or something. And then he says that she can go be an activist. Uh, so that's, but it's, I, it's a really interesting, and there's others, I mean, she's a fascinating figure. Again, happy to talk about her during Q&A as well. But OK, um, I, I want to have plenty of time for, so I'm going to quickly forge ahead. Um, affect, there are lots of people in this room that can talk, um, uh, they're better qualified than I am to talk about the question of affect. But I want to stress here the ways in which it's shaped the debates about once, what some scholars refer to as love labor. And the efforts to distinguish um, what they see as the inalienable and uncommodifiable labor that is, um, that they want to distinguish from the kind of emotional labor that Arlie Hochschild talks about and the intimate labors that people like Eileen Boris and Rasiel Parreñas talk about, that is to say, um, this, th they, the scholarship on love labor really wants to see this as something apart and that further problematizes how we value this. In particular, that love is a f critical to social justice, it's indispensable to human well-being, but it is unequally distributed and undervalued. This is an idea that comes um, in part from Hart and Negri's, uh, first from Commonwealth, but then from that whole, whole trilogy, and the question of where love, how love functions as a biopolitical event that is planned and realized in common. They see love as a social justice issue and um, indispensable for well-being and development, but is also something that requires action. It's not simply a feeling or a form of speech. It is something that actually requires active caretaking and that cannot be substituted or commodified. So somebody else can't love your kid for you. Um, somebody else might be able to read your kid a story but can't love your kid for you. And making a distinction there. Shiloh Whitney similarly talks about what she calls byproductive labor. That is to say, the labor of processing all of these emotions more in a commodified frame than the uncommodified frame. But the love labor scholars see these together, that, 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 that processing of other people's anxieties and other people's um, fears or whatever are, are part of the love labor of relationships that are indispensable to humanity. For Whitney, the byproductive labor is often more similar to what Arlie Hochschild talks about when she talks about the flight attendants that being required to process all of our bile as we travel on, on airlines these days. Um, although she's writing it back in 1983, I think. Uh, but so that the, the um, exhaustion, the sheer exhaustion that comes from having to process all of that and that how do you recognize and value that labor? Again, similarly, we might think to the byproductive labor of non-whiteness, that, that the just sheer exhaustion of navigating the wor a, a white supremacist world as non-white um, would be, I think, a similar. Uh, and that's the question that Encarnacion Gutierrez Rodriguez, who's coming for this workshop, if anybody wants to come, uh, she's coming for the workshop in early April. But her study of Latin American migrants in Western Europe, and particularly in Austria and, and Germany, and in some ways, she conjures this idea that Mary Douglas has right about dirt as the, the thing out of place, right? That it's the by, she call, Douglas calls it the byproduct of a systematic ordering and classification of matter. Um, so Gutierrez Rodriguez is talking about the ways that these migrant laborers are being, in, in a way, co uh, racially coded as out of place by being constantly made to be the ones dealing with the dirt, the both literal and metaphorical dirt of society. There's a whole trope in all of this about toilets we can talk about, um, but about the cleaning of toilets in particular, that not just from Nancy Hartsock and people, but that it's you know, a recurring trope in this, but uh, that, that a lot of these interview, in interviews with um, paid domestic workers talk about. So then there's the commodified form of love labor that we see in movies like Roma, Right, this the, where there is love, but it's a it's a more commodified form of love, or it's it's mediated by commodification. And then um, Arlie Hochschild's work uh, from two decades, that from the um, 
not just from uh, the stuff on, on emotional labor, but her work in Global Women, which is the book that she wrote with uh, Barbara Ehrenreich about the global ch migration chains of, of care labor. There, Hochschild writes, so this is from 2000, but time and energy are not all that, that's involved. So too is love. In this sense, we can speak about love as an unfairly distributed resource extracted from one place and enjoyed somewhere else. She describes love as a renewable resource, but one that can't be in two places at once. In this sense, she writes, love does appear scarce and limited, like a mineral extracted from the earth. The notion of extracting resources from the third world in order to enrich the first world is hardly new. It harks back to imperialism in its most literal form. The low value placed on caring work results neither from an absence of a need, of need for it, nor from the simplicity or ease of doing it. Rather, the declining value of childcare results from the cultural politics of inequality. And I should say, one of the things that sort of inspired this uh, project that I'm working on now, this care labor project, is this sense of this pervasive sense that everybody is working insanely hard, and yet we have widespread unemployment, which I find, um, or, and underemployment, so difficult to, it seems to me like a value problem, right? OK, quickly, so we can get to <laughs> Q&A, uh, sex. So, um, <laughs> so, uh, so Federici, Sylvia Federici reforms to sex as a form of labor. And in fact, I, I think in a way that cautions us about the, the language of freedom that so freedom and choice that so characterized neoliberalism, she warns us in 1975 that sexual liberation has intensified our work. And I, which was a point that really struck me, not least because Quentin Michel, whose, um, whose adoptive family of, of, Bohem of cultural bohemians in Mexico City is a quite um, sexually adventurous one. It, it, it involves, uh, you know, Tina Madotti and Frida Kahlo and Dara Rivera and, and that whole crowd. Quincy Michel wrote constantly about sex, but she wrote about it only as a form of labor and never as a form of pleasure, which I know, right? So, um, and part of this is that she's doing, she's making a move that um, Eric Wilson has made in, in an article of, of setting up this zero sum game between sexual liberation and social justice. And that I think is something that is such a recurring motif in feminist politics that we, we still need to wrestle with it. Um, uh, I'm gonna skip some of this stuff, but we can talk about sex later if you want. Uh, I, I will say this, uh, well no, I'll come back to it in a second. So decoloniality and indigeneity, um, I, I think that, um, Again, we can talk about this more, but I think one of the more interesting moves that's being made, and I'm thinking here about people like Arturo Escobar um, and his designs for the pluriverse, but is this way of um, both that, that the turn toward the post-human has made us rethink the relationship between the human and the natural world and between, and has made us really question those dyadic modes of male-female, um, you know, homework, all of this stuff is also this, his insistence that there's a sort of ontological politics that, it, that comes from situated places, and in particular, comes from activists. And in some ways, this is a kind of Gramscian move of bringing intellectuals from uh, maybe unexpected places, but, um, and reshaping our intellectual life and, and, and what we think about as, as intellectual debate kind of from the ground up. Um, and in particular, I think for someone like Escobar and the, and the decolonials from the, indigenous, from particularly indigenous spaces. We're gonna, I think, get, probably get a better sense of that with the next talk, so I won't uh, try to do that justice. But, um, and then the final thing I wanna talk about, just to return quickly to Quentin Michel, is the problem of some of these ideas being appropriated by quite conservative elements. Um, that is to say, the recognition of care laborers tends to happen most in pro-natalist and often deeply essentialist regimes like the Vichy or the Third Reich, for example. Uh, someone yesterday sent me a link to the, the Duterte's Philippines. They have now a mother's salary system. Um, and even in, somewhat in, in progressive spaces like Brazil, where you have the Bolsa de Familia, it, it comes with a kind of disciplining, uh, disciplining uh, message. Uh, similarly, Concha Michel, she links this demand for recognition of reproductive labor with an open antipathy, I mean, she ex explicitly links, the, links this both, both rhetorically and politically, with an open antipathy toward both homosexuality and intersex. And she sees those as, as inseparable. Um, so is, is there a way, is there a kind of progressive way forward of this to, 
incorporate both sexual and gender diversity and a recognition of care labor. Um, and then finally, a question of whether there is anything redeemable in the maternalist movements, which for Latin Americanists, they have, a, we are kind of ambivalent because these were really critical movements for bringing down authoritarian regimes in places like Argentina and, and Chile. On the other hand, they do, of course, always reinscribe a very particular conceptualization of, of women and gender and, and the concept of care. Okay, I'm going to stop with that question. <laughs> and, um,